In addition to being knighted for his service to the arts, Sir Ken Robinson is one of the foremost experts in creativity, generally in its many forms. He's worked with many of the world's cultural organizations as well as companies and governments. He's also led a commission on creativity, education, and the economy for the UK government and produced an influential report called Out of Our Minds, Learning to Be Creative. Sir Ken is a past professor of education at the University of Warwick, now Professor Emeritus. He's received numerous honorary degrees, and last year he won the prestigious Peabody Medal for his contributions to the arts and culture in the United States. He's also a best-selling author, and his latest book is called The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. And Sir Ken Robinson joins me now in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Good morning, John. Very good to see you. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here. And and uh, it was most inspiring to see you speak last night, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I get to see you two days in a row. I'm lucky. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and after seeing you speak and knowing a lot of what you have to say and reading your book, there's so much to get to. Uh, let me see if I can get to some of this in, uh, in, this, uh, in this chat. I, I want to talk about this book, but first, let's talk about your passion for promoting creativity in the education uh, system. It's, it's what brought you to Toronto uh, for, for this music event. Why is creativity so important to you, personally speaking? I think it's because I've thought for years and, and, and experienced for years the fact that so many people have no idea what they're really capable of doing. I meet so many adults uh, who are uh, convinced they don't have any real talents, you know, who spend most of their lives doing things they're not very interested in, bumping along the bottom in a vague state of depression and uh, feeling they don't really have any special gifts or, or abilities at all. And yet I meet all kinds of other people who... Uh, love what they do and have found something in themselves that's transformed their lives. And I think we all have those talents. I think we all have those gifts uh, and that many people are steered away from them almost systematically mm. by the way they're educated. And I think it's a tragedy. I think it's a tragedy for them and I think it's a tragedy for all of us. You know, it's a huge waste of human talent. You, many people, but including you, hail creativity as the highest level of learning and intelligence. That might surprise some people. Why, do you, why would you make that case? Well, you know, I think that imagination, which underpins all of this, is the most distinctive feature of human intelligence. It, it's what sets us apart from everything else on the planet. Very few other things set us apart from all the other things on the planet. But this ability is distinctive. And look at the extraordinary achievements that human culture has brought about. And it shows itself very early on. You know, I mean, if you take a small child into a garden and point at the moon, the child will look at the moon. Take your dog into the garden and point at the moon, and the dog will look at your finger you know, and, and wonder what your problem is. And this capacity to, uh, to be uh, stimulated and enlivened by looking beyond yourself is right. distinctive to human beings. But if you and keep your finger near the moon, the dog will see both. Uh, yes, but it'll be thinking about its dinner, <laughs> <laughs> in all probability. So, so I, th I think it's the most powerful capacity that we have. And, it, no, we're facing a world of extraordinary challenges on every front. And it's this capacity that will get us through it or not. And we can't afford to squander it. I, I, I wonder if our, uh, our failure, uh, you, you might make the case, to, to elevate creativity to where it, it should be uh, in, in our school system is, is because, it's, to a certain extent, it's because it's hard to measure. I mean, uh, it's impossible to think of education without thinking of re results, right? Report cards, tangible evidence that the child is actually learning something. Do you think that part of the reason that creativity isn't taught more or celebrated more in school is because it isn't as measurable? I think it's because people um, have misconceptions about it. And uh, there are lots of them. One of them is that uh, only special people are creative. This simply isn't true. You know, to me, that would be like saying only special people are literate. Well, you know, we know everybody can be taught to read and write in ordinary circumstances. It's just some people know how to do it, and they've attended to it. Uh, people think it's about special things, like it's only about the arts. But you can be creative at anything, you know, at, at maths, at science. I mean, some of the most creative people I know are scientists. Um, and people think there's nothing you can do about it. And actually, there's a lot you can do. Mm. But you have to start by defining it. And, and I think a lot of people, particularly policymakers I talk to, are under the impression that being creative is just about kind of cutting loose and going crazy and knocking the furniture down. Yeah, and, <laughs> right. And, I mean, it can involve that sure. you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at times. But, but really, creativity is about having original ideas, original ideas that have value. And as soon as you know that... What you, what you move on to realizing is that to be creative, you have to do something. 
you know, you can't just lie in bed all day and say, you know, I had a really creative time. Because you can only really sense creativity by the things that people do. But you can be creative at anything, you know, cooking, at, uh, at running a radio station, at anything. Mm. So the reason I'm saying that is when people say uh, creativity is not measurable, it's because I think they don't understand what it is. It's, it's as if they believe it's some extra thing that happens on, uh, on its own. So if you want to judge creativity, you have to look at the but it, field but in which people are being creative, you know, and say, well, is this creative mathematics? Is this creative music? Is this creative broadcasting? Mm. And once you lock it down to the sort of things people are doing, then you can begin to sense whether this is original and good or not. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is harder to measure than what's two plus two or, or point out Moose Jaw on a map, you know, right? I mean, it's, 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 uh, it, it does have a more... Um, uh, expansive quality that that um, leads one to think it's there's subjectivity involved. I mean, ha if somebody draws something, how 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 are we supposed to measure whether it's good or bad? Or and and that isn't that what our school system is based on? Way to go! That's a good drawing. Sorry, you're you're not very good at that. <laughs> yeah, it, the the thing is that our school systems are based on on the idea of measurement, and I believe this is a dreadful mistake. Uh, you know, that some of the most important things that people achieve don't lend themselves this kind of quantification. And you're right, people sometimes say, well, it's purely subjective. Well, I don't object to that. Um, you know, some of the most important things that happen in our lives are based on our personal judgment about whether they're important or not. But I think it's equally important not to make a false distinction here, you know, mm -hmm. between objectivity and subjectivity. Um, you know, when I, I work a lot in education systems, and I think they've become obsessed a policymakers have become obsessed with standardized testing and you know standardized testing has a place you know I mean I mean I was saying recently if, if I have a medical exam I, I want some standardized tests you know I want to know what my cholesterol level is compared to everybody else's mm. I don't want it based on some personal scale my doctor invented in the car. You know, I don't want to say right. your cholesterol is what I call level orange. <laughs> you know, I tell me, right. tell me how it compares. Not looking for creativity. Not, right. Well, the thing is that um, there isn't a, um, a hard distinction here. You know, if you're going to be a creative musician, you need to be able to play. If you're going to be a creative mathematician, you need to understand the math. You know, if you're going to be a creative anything, you need to control the discipline. Creativity is that extra bit where you're pushing the boundaries mm. and looking for originality. Um, and getting that balance right is really important. It's why I'm saying that being creative isn't just kind of going crazy. It's, it's being in control of what you're doing, but pushing the boundaries into new and unexplored territory. It may be new to you and only to you, or it may be new to the whole world. But it's not just going into free fall. Mm. You know, it's having a balance between imagination and speculation and learning things. It's why I don't see an opposition between literacy and numeracy and creativity. Would you get rid of standardized testing? No, um, but I would get rid of the obsession with it. Mm. You know, uh, education in the end is a very personal business in the sense that you can't make anybody learn anything they don't want to learn. Uh, you know, in Canada at the moment, there's something like a 30% dropout rate from schools. And I mean, that's an appalling statistic. And I say it not against Canada because it's even higher in the United States. Mm -hmm. And even among kids who stay in school, there's a huge level of disaffection. So um, education has to be personalized. You have to engage how people think and how they learn. You know, if you want to raise reading standards, you have to look into people's eyes and encourage them to want to, to learn to read. I can't imagine there's a kid in Canada who jumps out the bed in the morning and thinks, what can I do to raise the province's reading standards? You know, <laughs> how can I help? You know, I'm, I'm here at your disposal. You know, they, they, they need to be engaged. And that's the skill of great teachers. And this culture of standardized testing, I think, is um, depriving teachers of the essential freedom they need to do their job properly. So, Ken, these are hard times, as you know, particularly for the arts in schools. And when music educators are faced with cuts, they often resort to defending learning music in, say, in terms of how it will improve a student's academic achievement uh, in other disciplines as well, like math or English. But back in 2000, two Harvard researchers, Ellen Winner and Lois Hetland of Project Zero, conducted a study which said that arts educators shouldn't justify by comparison. They wrote the arts must be justified in terms of what the arts can teach that no other subject can teach. This is something to what you were talking about last night what do you what do you make of this well the there is a case for saying that uh, the work in the arts encourages 
improvements in other disciplines. I don't like the word subjects very much, but I, I think in other disciplines that's true. Um, and in a way, that's, that's not, as they say, rocket science. You know, I mean, if kids find things they're good at, that they enjoy, that energize them and raise their confidence, their overall performance is likely to improve. And there's a raft of studies that show that that's the case across the board. Um, but I agree with, uh, with Lois Nell, and I know them, and I, I knew them when they were doing the study, that I don't want to defend the arts or music on the basis that it helps people do mathematics better. Mm. I don't want to defend mathematics on the basis that it helps people to draw better. You know, there are things that are inherent to these disciplines which are important in themselves. You know, uh, there's, there is something about making music, listening to music, which appeals to our deeper sense of humanity. And I don't want to explain the importance of that because it helps you know, to understand grammar. Mm. You know, you should understand grammar anyway. So, uh, yes, I believe strongly that there is a powerful case for the arts in their own right. And the fact is that at the moment in Canada, you know, the arts are falling lower and lower down the hierarchy in education. And it's for mistaken reasons, and I think it's a tragedy. I think that we're depriving a generation of kids of experiences which are essential to their balanced growth and development and to the health of, of the culture of the country. And like what? Can you speak to, just very briefly, uh, what, what you see in, in say, art or, or a dance class that, uh, or, or a, a visual art class in, in say, high school or, or grade school, that what, what the child takes from that, other than the ability to then do math better, <laughs> what, <laughs> what the child takes from that that you think is invaluable? Well, um, and I'm, I'm very interested in dance, I used to be on the board of the Royal Ballet uh, years ago. And in most schools, kids aren't encouraged to dance anymore. And when you say dance, I, I believe this. I think dance should be taught every day in schools. And people look at you as if you've, you've kind of been taking something. And I think, well, why? You know, I mean, we are embodied people. You know, we're not just sort of heads on a frame. You know, um, our, the way we think, the way we feel is deeply affected by our sense of physicality. And... Dance, to me, is one of the most uh, extraordinary examples of the unification of human creativity and thinking. The fact is, you know, that we think in all sorts of different ways. I think this is the heart of it. Uh, education has become obsessed, for particular reasons, you know, we could talk about if we have time, but it's become obsessed with a particular type of academic ability. And academic ability is very important, but it's very specific. You know, but we think in all kinds of ways. We think visually, we think in sound, we think in movement, uh, we think in conceptual ways. And for some people... These are their real strengths. That's what this book is about. You know, that the people think in very different ways. They see the world in different ways, and they have different strengths. And the problem with the current system is that we're putting everyone through the same mill uh, as if we're producing motor cars. And the result of it is this massive level of alienation. Mm. And when you have a 30% dropout rate, you can't blame the kids for that. You can't say, well, what's wrong with this 30% of the, of the student population, you know, that they don't get what we're offering them. The fact is there's something in the system which is losing them. Right. And part of what's losing them is uh, that we're promoting a particular type of ability above everything else. And the fact is that our communities, our economies, our, our nations depend upon diversity, not conformity in this strict way that schools are being forced to promote. I've got a couple of minutes left with you here, and I, I, I just w I want to talk a bit about your book, uh, The Element. Uh, it's called The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. In it, you expand on, on your ideas about music education, and you explore the idea that everyone has a purpose or talent that they need to discover. You talk about the, ele the element being a, a fusion of natural aptitude and personal passion. Uh, is this more about some form of social responsibility or personal happiness? Well, it's both. Uh, again, I always resist dichotomies, you know, like this. There's very, I, I quote um, a, a study in the book about the senses. And I've asked audiences all around the planet about this. I say, how many senses have you got? And invariably, people say, I've got five, you know, and maybe a sixth one. Uh, and by the five, you know, the conventional ones, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and so on. And the, the, the sixth one is normally intuition. And I always say, well, that's like a spooky sense, you know, that, that girls have got more of. And... <laughs> The, the, but many cultures don't see it that way at all. Um, one of the studies in the book, uh, I quote, uh, has never thought to count the senses in, in that way. Uh, and, uh, and, but they add one that we never think about, which is balance. So m my point is that if we underestimate our basic equipment as human beings, what else do we underestimate? And I think we underestimate our intelligence. I think we underestimate our capacity for creativity because of the way we've been educated. And I don't speak in criticism of teachers, but I think we have to recognize that this system of education came about very recently to meet the needs of a different type of world, the mm. industrial economies of the 19th and 20th century. So to me, the heart of the change 
is to have a different view of what people are capable of achieving. Mm. And uh, that's what the element is about. And I think if individuals become more centered on their own strengths and capacities, that can only be good for the health of our communities and also for our economy. So I want to connect these things rather than dissociate them. Uh, I'm literally out of time with you here, but I, I, uh, I've been wanting to ask you this. If you, you, you so focus on young, young people, um, which is great. I mean, it's admirable. I'm not taking anything away from that. But it, I wonder if you think, in terms of your uh, inspired mantra in this book, of following your passions, essentially, is, is part of what you're saying. Um, if you think there's a best before date on that, in other words, what would you say to a 50-year-old who says, you know what, I, 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 maybe I'm not one of those people you described at the beginning of this interview, that you know, they're not in a job that they love, and et cetera, but how am I supposed to follow my passions? I've got kids, I've got things to do, I, I've, I've got a life that's already set up, I've got bills to pay. Yeah, I get it, Sir Ken, thank you, but how am I supposed <laughs> to do this? Yeah. Well, actually, th- th- this book isn't just about kids. Uh, we've been talking about children, but uh, I have a chapter in it called It's Not Too Late. And uh, I, I think for as long as you're drawing breath, these arguments apply to you. And uh, I have a lots of examples of people in their 50s and 60s and 70s who discovered this thing in themselves and began to be somebody else. You know, life in the end is not a one-way street. You know, this is an organic process. And if you find your passions, your world starts to transform around you. And I agree. You know, we all have bills to pay. I have bills to pay. Um, and this isn't uh, some kind of loose romantic argument. Uh, But in the end, your life is likely, I think, to take on greater purpose and meaning if you're doing things that fulfill you. And I think you have a responsibility to yourself to do that. And by the way, if we've learned anything of the past few months, it's that all the old bets are off at the moment. You know, (laughs) we're all going to have to reinvent ourselves. So this is the perfect moment, whatever age you are, to start to think about it. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Next time longer. Thank you so much, sir. Sir Ken, see, I can call you sir, and you're actually sir. You I, I, I normally call people sir on the show, but <laughs> Sir Ken Robinson, his latest book is called The Element, How Finding Your Passion Changes Everything. It's published by Viking, and Sir Ken was with me here today in Studio Q.